Okay, so we are entering into chapter 12, section one. Chapter 12 um, as a whole sort of is centered on Asia. It's gonna take a look at China, and then it's gonna go into the Mongolian world, uh, the world of the Mongols, Genghis Khan, his descendants. Then it bounces to Japan, and then finishes up with Southeast Asia, the Khmer Empire and the Daviet Empire as well. So we'll take a look at some of these things. Some of them I'm sure that you have heard of in the past, some of them probably not so much. So let's start with chapter 12, section one, which is on Tang and Song, China. Roman numeral one says the Tang dynasty expands China. Uh, the first emperor of the Sui dynasty was a ruler named Wendi. The dynasty really didn't last a whole lot of time, but it did create one of the biggest accomplishments in Chinese history, which is known as the Grand Canal. The Grand Canal is a system of waterways, man-made by the way, that connected the Chengyang and the Wanghe rivers, and also connected the Northern cities to the Southern rice producing regions of the Chang Delta. The Grand Canal and portions of the Great Wall were worked on by Chinese people under the Sui dynasty. Now, thousands of people did die working on these projects, which eventually led to a lot of rebellions against the dynasty. And eventually the dynasty was overthrown because of this and, and severely weakened. The Tang dynasty though, uh, did have a very powerful empire when they came into play. Uh, the Tang dynasty came, ruled for 300 years. They came into play around 618 when the Sui kind of went out of power due to those revolts and rebellions. And they lasted until about 907. One of the first important rulers is Tang Taizong. Tang uh, was really the emperor who ruled from 626 to 649. Some of the things that he did was uh, to expand the borders to the west and to the north and to recover some of the lands lost at the end of the Han Dynasty, which uh, was covered back in chapter seven. Also a very famous female leader was Wu Zhao. She's a female empress. She became the only female to assume the title of emperor for herself in the year 690. She's most well known for leading the Tang conquest of Korea, which then became part of China. Um, number four, Tang rulers continued to expand their roads, canals, and also defense walls, uh, which were you know projects that started under the Sui dynasty. Capital C is gonna talk about these positions known as scholar officials. The Tang would continue the ancient use of the civil service examination. The problem with this is that relatively few scholars were able to actually pass the test. I think it was roughly 10%. And then those that did uh, pass the test, which was based on Confucian ideology, they became known as scholar officials. This system led to the idea of what is known as today a meritocracy. So talent and education became more important for people's success than noble birth and social class did. Capital D talks about how the Tang sort of go out of power. The Tang began to levy high taxes uh, to fund wars and projects, but even though they were collecting a lot of money from, from almost everyone in the empire, except for those who owned large plots of land, uh, they really still could not control invasions. They were eventually defeated by the Muslims in 751 which led to the loss of a lot of land in Central Asia. Then later in 907, Chinese rebels overthrew the Tang at the capital city of Chang'an. The next group in power would be the Song Dynasty. Uh, they would come into power after the Tang and they would restore China to a pretty powerful state. Now, if you're in the AP class, this is kind of where your knowledge needs to begin uh, from this. I, I gave you a little bit of background as to how the Song come into power, but really the the criteria for the AP test is with the Song Dynasty. Uh, after the Tang were overthrown, what happened is a time period in which rival warlords sort of divided China into separate independent kingdoms. In 960, a general named Taizu reunited China and claimed himself as the first emperor of the Song Dynasty. Now the Song, like the Tang, also lasted for roughly 300 years from 960 to 1279. Thing about it is the Song, because of the previous dynasties, they didn't rule as large of an area as other dynasties did, but they were more successful at bringing peace and stability. They did start off as paying tribute to their Northern enemies in hefty amounts of silver, silk, and tea. Uh, but from what I understand, basically these people in the North, the Jerkins of the Jin Empire, uh, 
they would uh, accept the gifts and they would just continue to attack. It really had no bearing. It, it was really a, a bad decision by the Sung and they needed to get out of that. So by 1127, basically the Sung stopped paying that tribute and they sort of, I would say they condensed their land down into Southern China and created a new capital city at Hangzhou. So from there, what we're gonna talk about next is between the two groups that we're learning about today, the Tung and the Sung, what are some of the innovative things that they did? Well, capital letter A talks about science and technology. The Tung and Sung created numerous inventions and developments that can be found and studied on pages 328 and 329. We'll take a look at those pages here at the end of the lesson. The most important inventions during this time though were gunpowder and movable type. I'll talk about both of those. The other ones I would like you to study from the page numbers that I mentioned above. Movable type is basically where you have blocks of individual characters and symbols that can be arranged into a metal or wood frame, which would create an entire page for printing. So what you do is you do a lot of work creating a template. Like let's say in today's world, you're reproducing the Bible, okay? Which is what the first printing press ever uh, printed, created uh, not by the Chinese, but in Europe much later. So this was like a machine that used this idea of movable type. But in China, what they would do is they would take their symbols and they would make a template of page one, okay? And um, they would move the individual symbols, what we would say, we would call individual letters onto a template. They'd slap ink on it and then press it down onto a page to create a piece of paper, which would be page one. And then they would create a template for page two. And all they needed to really do was save these templates in order uh, for each individual page of a book and they could totally reproduce that by slapping the ink on. Generally what they would do is like, let's say they were gonna make 10 copies of a book. They would make the template and they'd slap the ink on the template and press 10 copies right down there of page one, go on to the next page, so on and so forth and keep them in order. This is sort of a major deal because it makes uh, you know, books easier to produce than writing them out individually by hand, every single character, every single word, every single letter, which was sort of the job of monks um, and, and other scribes, but that takes forever. So this cuts down the time, which is gonna cut down the labor, which means that uh, the books are going to be able to be sold for a cheaper price. So that means in turn that more people can afford books. And so then therefore more people can be educated, not just the super rich, but maybe now the middle class and some of the lower class as well. Gunpowder was also first developed by these groups. Um, they were, it was first used for fireworks, like uh, they would put on displays for the emperor and so on and so forth. But eventually some of the military guys are like, hey, we, we can actually use this to uh, blow things up. And so they started to make weapons like bombs, grenades, rockets, cannons, uh, some of your earliest guns. Kepler B talks about the importance of agriculture. Around 1000, the farmers of China, they began to import a fast ripening type of rice from Vietnam. This type of rice is called champa rice. It's from a region in Vietnam called Champa. It's along the coast. It's, uh, it's rice that ripens much faster than normal. And so therefore it allowed for two harvests of rice per year. This then allowed farmers over the year to produce more food and thus help support the rapidly growing population in, in China and throughout the regions that China controlled. Next, we'll talk about the expansion of trade and foreign contacts. As, portion of the Chinese, as portions of the Chinese lands were being taken over, land-based trade started to decline, but sea trade began to increase with the help of inventions like the magnetic compass, for example. Chinese traders began to sail to Korea, Japan, all the way across the Indian Ocean into the Persian Gulf region, and of course, all the way to Africa as well. Foreign traders and diplomats would then reside in Chinese cities. Most of those diplomats and, and traders were from Arabic lands. Um, religion, ideas, and other cultural aspects began to diffuse. This is the term that we've learned is very much a part of every lesson, cultural diffusion. And then capital D talks about art and poetry uh, the Tang period brought in a golden age of poetry. Two famous poets to study would be Li Bo and Tu Fu. You can find uh, excerpts from them in the textbook of this section toward the end. Roman numeral number four talks about changes in Chinese society. What developed here are essentially social classes. The upper class became known as the gentry. This was a new and powerful upper class class 
which was made up of those scholar officials that had passed those examinations and became sort of uh, government officials and, of course, their families also. Then below them came what was known as the urban middle class of merchants, shopkeepers, skilled artisans, and other groups. At the bottom were soldiers, day laborers, servants, and peasants. They made up the vast majority of the population in China. The status of women, uh, women in China were always viewed as sort of subservient to men. They were not on equal status. However, their status actually declined under the Tang and Song dynasties. One practice that sort of exemplified this decline was the practice of foot binding. Young girls in upper class societies would have their feet bound with cloth at a very young age. So if if the foot is generally like this, right, you, you can see the arch of my hand. That's kind of like how your, your the bottom of your foot is. Some people are a little bit flatter than others, but there's generally an arch there. Uh, what foot binding would do is tie the foot like this to where the toes were curled all the way back. It, it, it essentially breaks their foot and uh, it, it snaps their arch in half, The what are called the, I think it's the metatarsal bones. It's been a long time since I've taken anatomy class, but I'm pretty sure it's the metatarsal bones, which are in the midpoint of the foot. And uh, then your toes are called the phalanges. But one of the things that you have to understand is that this crippled these women for life. And most of these young girls who this happened to were in the upper echelons of society. They couldn't really walk. And so what this was in society is that uh, men who married these women, this was a sign of wealth and prestige for the man because it meant he could afford to have both a beautiful but yet impractical wife because she could not do anything and he had to take uh, or pay servants to take you know, entire care of this woman. So it's kind of a sad uh, thing. It's, it's really degrading to women, but um, it, was, it was called lily foot and it was seen as a sign of beauty too. Uh, if you've ever seen any pictures, you, you should probably look them up it's uh, it's probably not uh, in in modern times a very attractive sight. Um, it's it's actually pretty sad. So I would encourage you to look up foot binding and uh, see what you find there. It's a, it's a pretty uh, pretty um, awful practice that went on in ancient China, but uh, it's a different cultural practice. So let's take a look here at the end of the lesson at some of the key pages in, of course, your text. Uh, so what we're talking about here is the Song Dynasty right in here. It's this part of China. Uh, up here, they had lost this region to different groups um, after the Tang sort of went out of power. Um, some of the key rivers, here's the Wangha, here's the Chongyang. Okay, here's the Great Wall of China. Here's the one portion of it. Here's another portion of it. Um, I'll take it down through some other pages here. Uh, here's a key timeline, of course, to study. Um, you know, some of the things that you understand how they look. Here's what silk work looked like. Here's a early magnetic compass that Chinese navigators would use. Here's early gunpowder paper. These are all inventions that you will read about in this chapter. Um, of course, there's the opening page. This is Tang Tazong, a little bit more information. Wu Zhao, the female empress. Uh, so you, you can get a little bit more detail than what I talked about. But Nonetheless, acupuncture, which was a practice that came in during the Song Dynasty. Uh, this is Tu Fu. This is a poem. I told you Tu Fu and Li Bu were some of the most famous poets. Uh, painting kind of looked like this. A lot of the paintings during this time were represented nature. Um, if you're in my classroom, I have a poem that looks very similar to this um, that you can see. And it's also about nature. So it came from this time period as well. And then these are the, I think, the most important pages, Tang and Sung, China, the people in the technology. It talks about many of the great inventions right here, like porcelain, the clock, uh, block printing, movable type, gunpowder, paper money, which came about in the 1020s, and of course, the magnetic compass. Then the next page has a really nice insert on movable type. This is sort of what I was trying to explain. Here's the template. Here's the pieces of paper that it eventually presses onto. Here are all the individual symbols. Imagine that each one of these little trays would be a letter, okay, or even a word, and you kind of put those all together onto the template and then press it down. Uh, this says the two wheels held about 60,000 characters, so they're usually utilizing way more, I think, than we would have to use. Uh, 
to create these templates. But it still takes a long time at first, but then it definitely speeds up the process in the long run there. A uh, little bit of an example of how the Chinese created early forms of rockets and weapons from gunpowder. The next section, of course, we'll take a look at the Mongol conquest. Now, if you have me for AP World History, um, you, you take a look at chapter 11 and then, you know, regular world history, we'll see chapter 11 as well. But basically in chapter 11, we learned about how the Mongol, Mongol people conquered Russia. And so we talked a lot about some of the practices that they enforced and some of the ways that they treated the conquered people. So I probably won't go into much depth about those type of things in section two, but of course you'll be assigned to read section two entirely. So you'll get a refresher on that as well. Thank you. Uh, I'll be back for chapter 12, section two.